All right, so Matt, there's these three older guys sitting on a bench, a 60-year-old, 70-year-old, and 80-year-old. 60-year-old goes, man, I got this problem. I wake up every morning at 7 a.m., and it takes me 20 minutes just to pee. Well, the 70-year-old goes, man, my problem's worse. I get up at 8 a.m., and I sit there, grunt and groan for half an hour before I'm finally able to have a bowel movement. And the 80-year-old goes, not me. At 7 a.m., I pee like a horse, and at 8 a.m., I crap like a cow. And the 60-year-old goes, so what's your problem? He goes, I don't wake up till 9. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. <laughs> All right, everybody, here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? I'm good, man. Good deal. Good. good deal. So before we get into it, I want to say go check out the Podbelly Network at podbelly.com. You can find a list of shows that we're happy to be associated with, and I guarantee you, you're going to find something on there that you enjoy that you may not run across anywhere else. And they have tips and tricks on podcasting. If you're interested in starting your own podcast, they got tips about doing that. We also want to thank tonight's sponsors, Raycon and HelloFresh, and we'll talk more about them coming up. While you're on the internet doing your thing, go over to patreon.com slash graveyard tales, sign up to become a patron. We've got three different levels of patronage that you can sign up for. We could not keep doing this show if it wasn't for our patrons. Um, Absolutely. I know that sounds cliche, but it's a hundred percent true for us. We being an independent show, our patrons and our sponsors are the only way that we can keep doing this with mm-hmm. the, the money that's needed for equipment and software. And when equipment fails, <laughs> yeah. you know, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for you guys, then the show would have probably quit years ago when our first equipment failed. Cause we couldn't afford right. to keep buying new, new stuff all the time. So, <laughs> and, and yeah, and believe it or not, we started this show with borrowed equipment. Yeah. We, I mean, that was just, it was what we had. Yep. <laughs> and now look where we've come started from the bottom. Now we're about midway up. So, you know what they say. <laughs> That's the song, right? <laughs> started mm-hmm. from the bottom. We're a couple feet. You're higher. there. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> but sign up to become a patron over there. There's going to be something on there. You enjoy it runs the runs a gamut of topics. We do different stuff than we talk about on normal shows. We try to put one out every week, whether it's a 15 minute one or a 45 minute one, you get a bonus episode weekly and our $10 a month, they get an ad free version of the main episode. They get a video version of the main episode, which is also ad free. And they get an audio and video version of the bonus episode every week. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, Matt. So you know me. I'm a music junkie, and I always have been. I've got to be listening to music all the time with some podcasts sprinkled in. And, you know, I I love making the music and the podcast part of my fall routine because, I mean, fall, you talk about spring cleaning. There's fall cleaning, too. You got to do get get ready for the winter and all that. So, you know, during the cleaning and everything I do around the house, I've always got my raycon earbuds in and i love using them because raycon's everyday earbuds they look feel and sound better than ever like it's no joke the the best versions they've had they've got optimized gel tips that range in sizes for the perfect in-ear fit and they're so comfortable and they will not fall out of your head doesn't matter what i'm doing i can be out sweating in the yard i can be at the gym sweating i can be in the house cleaning or whatever you know, listening to music, avoiding editing, whatever it may be. <laughs> and they do not fall out. Plus, they've got eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. So you can do like I do. Put your left one in, listen till it dies, pop it out, put it in the case, pull out the other one. Your left one will be charging while you're listening through the right one. 
and you get three customizable sound profiles. So it, you you like jazz, uh, you can find a sound profile that really makes that pop. Um, podcasts, you know, vocal, spoken word, audiobooks, whatever. There's one for that. And and one thing that I have started doing is I have listened to these uh, these these tones that are meant to help stimulate focus and right, concentration right. while I'm working, uh, while I'm researching anything, and it really makes a difference because it also has noise isolation. So I don't want to hear everything going on. I've got to be able to concentrate. And, you know, with all these kids in my house <laughs> and dogs and cats and gorillas and everything else yeah, jumping zoo. around making noise i need the noise isolation but i do have kids so i i need to be able to know is something going on that needs my attention and that's why the awareness mode is, is so great you know if you want to hear the best quality audio but you still need to pay attention to the world that's around you the awareness mode fixes all that it's helpful if you're walking down the street, too. You that's can right. You're the car's right. coming. And they're IPX water and splash resistant. So if you're out, you know, jogging in the rain, um, if somebody th- throws water in your face for some weird reason, it's not going to hurt <laughs> them, okay? They're splash resistant. And and like Adam said earlier, they're not going to fall out, so you don't got to worry about that. Now, school is back in session, which means Raycon is having their annual back-to-school sale. For a limited time only, go to buyraycon.com slash tails today to get 20% off site-wide plus free shipping. That's right. Go to buyraycon.com. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N.com slash T-A-L-E-S to score 20% off. That's buyraycon.com slash tails. You won't regret it. So, Matt, that's all I've got. Uh, Why don't you tell us, what are we talking about tonight, brother? All right. So, this is one of these topics tonight that that Adam and I, these are the things that that he and I talk about when we're just hanging out talking. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, if, if the girls aren't involved, then our conversation will shift to something like this. Yep. And this is, you know, this is more of the, the ancient aliens type um, thing, and when I I'm, we'll 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 mention the alien part, I, <laughs> I promise. But but we're going to talk about the the city and the tribe of Tiwanaku, mm-hmm. and a a lot of people feel that the Tiwanaku were the the first humans that they they were here, uh, even more believe that they were the first Americans. Right. You know, if we're talking about North and South America, they, they were the first ones here. Um, we know that, that they're very old. We, we know from the artifacts they have left behind that they're very old. And with things that are very, very old, there's, there, there's legends and stories and speculation on how they did things. And, and Tiwanaku has, all of that. Yep. So, uh, we're, we're going to get into it. This one, um, Adam is going to talk about the the actual site of Tiwanaku. Um, you know what what makes it so unique, and and how how they constructed these things, and how what what's theorized behind it. Uh, and then we're going to get into some of the legends uh, of the Tiwanaku people. Um, they have their own creation story. It's, it's really really cool. So, uh, so Adam. Let's get into it. All right. So as we always say, go check our sources down at the bottom of the show notes. You can find where we found all this information and you can continue the research if you'd like, because I'm going to give a brief summary of the different parts, but we're not going to be able to get into all of it. There's thousands of years of history here in the Tiwanaku area. So we don't have thousands of years to discuss it. <laughs> we got like an hour and a half. So Thank I'm God. If that, yeah, right. So we'll we'll briefly go over it. And then when my ADHD kicks in, we'll move on to Matt. So, um, (laughs) but, you know, 
if we're going to talk about Tiwanaku, we're going to have to also talk about Pumapunku, which is mm-hmm. within the Tiwanaku complex. And we're going to have to talk about Lake Titicaca. So for just like 30 seconds, go ahead and laugh to yourself about Titicaca. <laughs> <laughs> yep. For, for 30 seconds, everybody is in third grade. Right. Here we go. I mean, it, it, <laughs> you can't help it. I, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> you know, I told Matt, I said, we're, we might have to, because this is a PG-13 show, we might have to call it Booby Poo Poo Lake, but <laughs> not going to. We're going to go with Lake Titicaca. But of course, when, when, when he brought this up, this was the, that was the first thing. I said. Exactly. <laughs> oh, we get to say this. Yep. So that's why I said, let's just get it out. Cause I'm going to say it a lot throughout this episode so uh, yeah you know get your jokes out now you can email them to us if you would like but um so people began actually to permanently settle around lake titicaca around four thousand years ago and i'm going to get a lot of this first bit of information from ancient oregons and ancient oregons Uh, wow not oregon (laughs) Not ancient Oregon, <laughs> ancient origin. <laughs> Whoo, it's going to be a fun night. We, we can't even pronounce words we know. I know. I know. <laughs> it's it's going to be a fun night. Uh, from ancient origins and the Smithsonian. So, you know, follow those links in the, the show notes there if you're interested. But about 4,000 years ago is when they started to settle this area. And by 1500 BC, a small agricultural settlement formed about 10 miles from the southern Bolivian shores of Lake Titicaca. So Tiwanaku was the highest city in the ancient world at an altitude of 12,600 feet and would grow to cover an area of around six square miles, which is huge for a one of the first cities around Lake Titicaca in this region. If you think about the elevation and to have a six square mile city at this elevation, uh, around 1500 BC, that that's just incredible to think about. Yeah, it's like ancient Denver. Yeah, because at that time, from what we hear, there weren't city complexes like that. At 1500 right. BC, there were not these massive city complexes. So what what made them do that here? Around Lake Titicaca at this elevation, and, and that's at this this large an area. Yeah, and that's and that's an interesting point because most settlements had to begin near, um, you know, a, a, a flat area where where farming could could take place. They had to be near a water source, so mm-hmm. that's why you know those um, uh, those settlements were along lakes and rivers. But they were down on the ground, so I mean, it was understandable that if you're if you're gonna build a civilization in the mountains like this, you're gonna have to have a water source, and that's probably why we don't see others. Sure, you know, with with Lake Titicaca being the lake at the highest elevation, it gave them a water source that they could build around. Um, so it was it was they had what they needed. The question is, is why? Mm-hmm. Because why that at that elevation, it seems like it would make everything more difficult. Yep. Yep. And for a lot of people, like for us in North America, if we were to travel down there and travel to Lake Titicaca, it would be difficult for us to breathe because we're not used yeah. to that elevation. We're whatever. Now, the people that live there are because they've lived there for, I mean, generations, but mm-hmm. That, that, you know, the first people to set up this city, it makes me wonder, were they from lower elevations or, you know, did they come from high elevation tribes and form this? I, I That's just one of the questions I have. But hundreds of years before the Inca empire spread along the Pacific coast of South America, there was this other civilization that prospered in parts of what is now Bolivia, northern Chile and southern Peru. It was the Tiwanaku State. Now, the Tiwanaku State, which lasted from about 550 to 950 AD, was one of three major first millennium powers in the Andes. But very little archaeological evidence has been found from the Tiwanaku compared to the Incas, whose empire rose to the height of its power in the 15th century. Now, 
I gave dates 550 to 950. Mm-hmm. Here's the issue. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say some more dates a little later on and you're going to go, but wait, you said it was different. I'm giving you the information that is out there. There's mm-hmm. some conflicting time periods because we don't know for sure. Exactly. It was, and, you so know, when we're ago, talking about something that old, it's mm-hmm. very difficult to, to date it. And, you know, there's no written history that they have. Um, so, so there's nothing to, to really use context to say, you know, they really just have to look at the, the geology. Yep. So they carbon date some things, but you can't carbon date stone. And most of what they find here is stone. Um, I'll talk about some of the other things they found, but it's from different time periods. Um, so we'll go ahead and talk about some of the other um, dates here. Um, go ahead and get that out of the way. Some scholars date the earliest remains found at the site to the early part of the early intermediate period, which is 200 BCE to 200 CE. Others suggest that the culture is evident in artifacts from the second millennium BCE. So, you know, there, there's questions as to exactly when. Um, probably much of the site, including many of the major buildings dates from the latter half of the early intermediate period, 200 CE to 600. Some construction, however, must have continued into the middle horizon, which was 600 to a thousand for during this period, it says Tiwanaku influences are seen at, uh, Wari and elsewhere in the central and Southern Andes. So after Tiwanaku, the Incas kind of moved in, uh-huh. you know, to that area. So they, they're not sure whether, wh- which civilization passed these cultural influences along. Was it Tiwanaku or the Inca, right? Now, this next part comes from Khan Academy that I found, and they had an extensive uh piece on Tiwanaku, and I thought they had some interesting information. It says the Tiwanaku civilization was centered in the Lake Titicaca region of present, present day southern Peru and western Bolivia. Although its cultural influences spread into Bolivia and parts of Chile and Argentina, Tiwanaku's main city center boasted a population of 25,000 to 40,000 at its peak, which is wild. Just oh, yeah. that many That's... people at that time frame. Uh, it, they said it, it consisted of elites, farmers, llama herders, fishermen, and artisans. So, I mean, this was a full-blown city. This was not just some hunter-gatherers that came around and they all decided to live together. This was a city with a class structure mm-hmm. living together. 25 to 40,000 people. Just incredible. Its ceremonial center was fe- uh, featured a tiered pyramid called Akapana and a temple complex, the Kalasasaya. Kalasasaya, close as I'm going to get. Sorry about that. That's yeah, good. Uh, this is perhaps one of the most iconic works of Tiwanaku's public architecture is the Gateway of the Sun. Yeah. And, this thing is is incredibly cool. Yeah, and I know Matt will end up talking about it more later because it's a very prominent feature. Um, but it's a monolithic portal carved out of a single block of andesite. The monument was discovered in the city's main courtyard and may have originally served as the portal to the Puma Punku, one of the city's most important public shrines. Now, the gateway contains low relief carvings across uh, the lintel set into a square grid. At the center of the lintel is Tiwanaku's principal deity. So the figure is faced frontally, holding two implements that end in bird heads. So it's like mm-hmm. sticks, mm-hmm. You know, fancy sticks that end in bird heads. We always see rulers, deities holding staffs of some sort. No different. He's got one in each hand. Ends in a bird head. And it says, perhaps representing a spear thrower and spears. But it says he wears an elaborate tunic decorated with human and animal faces. The eyes of the figure bear the characteristic Tiwanaku stylized teardrop. A winged feline, 
hangs down from the eye to the bottom of the face. Tendrils of hair emanate in rays from the head, terminating in feline heads and circles. Composite human human bird deities flank the central figure on both sides. So if you look at pictures of Tiwanaku, you'll see this gate. You'll see this big stone, and it's very intricately carved. Archaeologists speculate that the doorway was originally brightly painted and inlaid with gold. So Yeah, that's what I was going to say. When you look at the pictures, it's impressive in and of itself. But when you have to picture it as it probably was, which as Adam said, covered in gold. Yep. You know, and and very ornate and jeweled. Yep. Painted, you know, bright colors. And all. I mean, it, it, something to think about is the pyramids. If you think mm-hmm. about ancient Egyptian work, it all looks the color of sand now because mm-hmm. of weathering. Back in the day, it was painted bright colors, and we know that because there's we found some unweathered uh, pieces that have been hidden away. It's the same with the Gate of the Sun here. You know, in, they say, remember that the, quote, pristine and unadorned state of the ancient monuments we see today often bear little relationship to their original appearance. So that's true. You know, we see it and we think, oh, that's fantastic carving. It's beautiful. It was even more beautiful when it was painted, adorned with gold, probably jewels. Um, it, it had to have been immaculate. Now, Pumapunku is the name of a large temple complex located near Tiwanaku in Bolivia and is part of a larger archaeological site known as Tiwanaku. Now, the temple's origin. Uh, is a mystery, but based on carbon dating of organic material found on the site, archaeologists believe the complex may have been built by the Tiwanaku Empire. So, uh, this expansive region, you know, when you hear it talked about, you'll hear Tiwanaku, and you'll (laughs) hear people mention Pumapunku. I know for me, before I started doing the research, I assumed these were two separate areas done, you know, further apart, whatever, but Pumapunku and Tiwanaku are fairly close together. Mm -hmm. And it's assumed that they they were made by the the Tiwanaku people for the same the the same complex, basically. Says the most intriguing thing about Pumapunku is the stonework. And this is amazing. Pumapunku was a terraced earthen mound or- originally faced with megalithic blocks, each weighing several tens of tons. The red sandstone and andesite stones were cut in such a precise way that they fit perfectly into and lock in with each other without using mortar. The technical finesse and precision displayed in these stone blocks is astounding. Not even a razor blade can slide between the rocks. Some of these blocks are finished to, quote, machine quality, and the holes drilled to perfection. So there was an article from Wikipedia that describes the fantastic engineering that's involved in the temple's construction. Normally, I don't like using Wikipedia, but because I found this elsewhere said basically the same way, I'm just going to go ahead and use this article. Um, Says, in assembling the walls of Pumapunku, Each stone was finally cut to interlock with the surrounding stones and the blocks fit together like a puzzle, forming Mm -hmm. load-bearing joints without the use of mortar. One common engineering technique involves cutting the top of the lower stone at a certain angle and placing another stone on top of it, which was cut at the same angle. The precision with which these angles have been utilized to create flush joints is indicative of a highly sophisticated knowledge of stone cutting and a thorough understanding of descriptive geometry. Many of the joints are so precise that not even a razor blade will fit between the stones. Much of the masonry is characterized by accurately cut rectilinear blocks of such uniformity that they could be interchanged from one another while maintaining a level surface and even joints. 
The blocks were so precisely cut as to suggest the possibility of prefabrication and mass production. Technologies far in advance of the Tiwanaku's Inca successors hundreds of years later. Some of the stones are at an unfinished state, showing some of the techniques used to shape them. They were initially pounded by stone hammers, which can still be found in numbers on local andesite quarries, creating depressions and then slowly ground and polished with flat stones and sand. So before we move on, because I'm going to jump into uh, Lake Booby Poo Poo here in a minute, but <laughs> listen to the way that describes these stones. This is, I mean, immaculate mm-hmm. masonry work. We can't, I mean, go, if you got a brick house like we do, go out and look at the brick. Not a one of oh, yeah. those is, they're not touching each other because they've got mortar in between them because they're not going to be so finely polished and edge that they seat together without any gaps. It's very rare to find any stonework that has such precise surfaces to them that they fit together like that. And it's a highly skilled mason that can carve the stones to where they fit into joints. And go look up pictures of the joints that some of these, they, they, I mean, they're like uh, T joints and mm-hmm. crazy. And like I, I joints where they have a piece yeah. in the middle shaped like a capital I yep. that fits down in there and it locks two stones together. It's amazing. And they're, they're not going to come apart. And before we started recording, um, I was telling Adam, I, wa- I saw a video earlier today um, with uh, Giorgio uh, Suclos. Uh, he's, the, he's the ancient aliens guy, if you don't know. The guy with the hair. <laughs> he is at uh, Tiwanaku, and he is showing two very unique things uh, about the stones there. He shows... Two stones side by side uh, with a about an inch and a half gap between them. And he explains that the stone, the one stone was cut using a diamond blade saw. Mm-hmm. And the other one was cut by the Tiwanaku people some 2000 years before. Mm-hmm. And, and his words were, you know, the, the most advanced cutting stone cutting technology we have available to us today and here's a cut from 2000 years ago that looks identical mm-hmm. so a lot it makes a lot of people question how in the world did they do this yep. you know how were they this skilled it's one thing to just really be good it's another to not have not have the tools to do a job so well right well, and that that's the thing. They in that article, the snippet of the article I just read, it says they started with hammers, stone hammers, and then they finished by polishing it with a stone and sand. Mm-hmm. You can get there. I I I get that you can get there with that because it's abrasive and you are going to wear it down. But how would you get such primitive items like that to create such a smooth finish? And to interlock together. Now, I know mm-hmm. some people are going to say, well, you know, the weathering over time has made it seem like it's smoother than it really is. The, okay, I'll give you that on the solo blocks laying out by themselves. Mm-hmm. But we still have pieces of the complex of Puma Punku together. And we can see the joints. So it's not like it weathered that much whether it's smooth between each other. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like it could weather the surface, but where they're joined, if water trickles in there, it's going to trickle in a path. It's not going to wear it smooth. It's going to wear a, a, a hole. It's going to make it worse. Yes. Right. And it has not done that because they are, they fit together so perfectly. So I, I'll talk more about it later, but, this to me is points to it being proof that Matt and I 
are right in our theory that there was technology thousands of years ago that we don't know about. I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's the same technology that we have today. I'm not saying they had diamond tip power circular saws to do this, but they had some technology that was beyond what we give them credit for in order to be able to do this stuff because Tiwanaku Pumapunku are not the only ancient sites like that. You know, right. we may touch on some of the other ones at a later episode, but uh, before I, you know, blow into a whole nother realm of this, I'll say that for after Matt talks about his stuff, I want to jump into uh, Lake Titicaca real quick. So Lake Titicaca is the highest navigable lake in the world. It's the largest lake in South America in terms of volume. So Lake Titicaca, Peru is located in the department of Puno, bordering Bolivia in the Andes Mountains. Its surface is evenly distributed between Bolivia and Peru. So the lake is surrounded by Andean mountain ridges and slopes varying in altitude between 4,000 and 4,200 meters or 13,100 and 13,800 feet above sea level. The lake itself is located on a high plateau ranging from 11,200 to 13,100 feet above sea level. At this altitude, temperatures average less than 59 degrees Fahrenheit all year round, and it remains constant throughout the year. Temperatures don't drop at night or in winter as much as in other places at similar altitudes. So maybe that's a reason that area was chosen for the settlement. Yeah. You know, maybe great. they were. It's very, it's cold, but it, it's temperate. Yeah. It stays you know, the same. Yeah. You know what you're getting. So if, if you have something, if you, it's like San Diego, you know, mm -hmm. where, where it's always sunny and 72, mm -hmm. it, it, there's a very good chance that you're right. And that was why that area was, was chosen Yeah, it, because of that, of the climate, you know, you didn't have big swings in temperature, you know, that allowed you to do things year round that you probably would only be able to do uh -huh. seasonally. Now, Lake Titicaca is divided into two sub-basins. The larger one is Lago Grande, and the smaller is Lago Pequeño. So both lakes are connected by the Strait of Tequina. So Lake Titicaca is a geological wonder formed during the pre-Ice Age about 60 million years ago. The lake was formed when massive earthquakes shook the Andes Mountains, splitting the range in two and forming a hollow that eventually got filled with water from the melting glaciers, creating bodies of water and ultimately rivers and the immense Lake Titicaca. So the lake was the cradle of Peru's ancient civilization. The Puraca culture settled in this fertile land around 200 BC, and a millennium later, the Tiwanaku culture emerged and spread throughout the Altiplano and into Bolivia. Now, warlike tribes like the Aymaras and the Colas, Coyas, Coyas emerged bef uh, only to be absorbed by the Incas. It was the Inca civilization that unified the many cultures and spread into the land, forming the Inca Empire. That's why we hear so much about the Inca mm -hmm. more than the Tiwanaku culture, is because the Inca grew and absorbed all those cultures into the Inca empire so and it, it this is a, a little side side note here but um you know if if the ancient cultures of south america is intriguing to you and you know if you're like adam and i it should be um because there's a lot down there um you know the incas the mayans that or the, the aztecs they they did things that we don't understand today um but when we talk about the, the Incas and, and how they were so successful in building their empire is they took the best parts of all of these cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, they, the, instead of saying, if you're not like us, wipe you out. No, yeah. they absorbed them. Mm -hmm. They're like, we, we really dig what you're doing here. Um, 
we're a lot bigger than you, so you're I'm just going to become us. a part of us, yep. and you're going to show us how you do this. Mm-hmm. And instead of wiping out new ideas, new technology, um, you know, different, maybe better ways of doing things, they absorbed it, and it made them better as a right. whole. Right. Which is something we need to keep in mind, and I wish <laughs> those during the Inquisition had learned that. Because oh, yeah. <laughs> I've said this before, but with the, the burning of Maya, Inca, Aztec ritual sites, the, the burning of the, Ale- uh, the Library of Alexandria, I mean, we have lost so much knowledge that we could probably use today. Think about the, the society we would be now mm-hmm. if we hadn't had so much hubris that nope, this is the way we do it. If you don't do it this way, that's uh, you know that's ungodly. That that's uh, uh, a sin against man, and we can't do that. And we're yeah. gonna burn it. I mean, it just not not to go off on a tangent, or, or, but or or we have to we have to you know rid this region of these savages. Yes, yeah. I got news yep. for you. These savages are probably smarter than you. <laughs> by, by by many times, I'm sure. Been around longer, their civilization knows more, and you probably just made yourself stupider by doing that. You you've set yourself back 500 years because yeah. you burned their their text instead of reading their text. Anyway, right. going to move on before I get angry. So <laughs> Already a little perturbed, but we won't. Anyway, local indigenous people, the Uros, have settled in, you know, in the shores of the lake for thousands of years, but they also live on the islands. So this is right there in Lake Titicaca. They live on 40 plus man-made floating islands. These islands are made of reeds that grow along the shores of Titicaca. They also make boats from the reeds. It, pretty much anything that you need, they can make out of reeds. I've, I've seen swings. I've seen like big statues. Shoes. The, shoes. The boats are incredible that they make out oh, of Oh, yeah. Hey, the reeds are also edible. If, if you need something, peel the outer layer off. It's like heart of palm. You yeah. can eat the interior of the reed. And it, I mean, I'm fascinated. By that, I know you're going to talk more about the reeds and and the boats here in a second, but it just fascinates me how this area, and it is probably this way for a lot of areas if we don't overlook it, there is something there that you can do anything and everything with. Mm -hmm. And these people knew it way back then during the Tiwanaku age and before, and they still use that same knowledge today. It's been passed down through their history, their their elders pass this knowledge on, and they can do anything with this reed. And some people look at the reeds and go, it's a weed, cut it down. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's a little known fact that there was, a, there was a saying that came from this that we still, you'll still hear people talk about today. You know, it was the whole, if... Uh, if I'm wrong, I'll eat my hat. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm sure that's where that came from. <laughs> hey, I will say this about the hat, and this is not a joke. Um, they have there. There is a specific kind of hat. It's called a four corner hat. Uh, that is that region. And it's so funny because I saw a picture of this Tiwanaku hat. It's, it's made of, it's, it's, I guess it's made of reeds. It's, it's woven into almost like thread and they've, you know, it's got a design and everything, but it has these unique little tufts, four spots Mm. at the top. And it's called the four corner hat and it's indigenous to this area. Yeah. I watched a documentary that was done in 2017 and they had a local man that was helping them. He has on one of these hats Oh, nice. and it wasn't, it wasn't like he found like an artifact and decided he was going to wear it. They still use that design because his had the little 
the little muckluck ears that mm-hmm. came down. Because remember, it's cold. You it's know, cold, they're yeah. they're way up in the mountains. Um, and I it had like uh had like colors and 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 lettering and stuff. So I mm-hmm. like that's a that's a modern hat. He yeah, he he bought that at the Tiwanaku gift shop. Well, speaking of, <laughs> I'm sure they have a gift shop. Oh, they do. <laughs> and they've got some really cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of hat, I can't remember if it's Bolivia or Peru, but it's this area. If you look at pictures, the all the women in this area wear a certain, it's all, it's like a short top hat. It's like a, a, a it almost looks like they're too small, you know, but they, mm-hmm. they sit on top of the head and they're almost like a short top hat. I, I I saw a thing apropos of none of this except for the hat thing that they wear down there. Apparently, there were some people that came through, missionaries or something, and they wore this old style hat. It's not a bowler, but that'll give you a good thought. Unless you look up the pictures, you'll know what I'm talking about. Well, the women, I think it's Bolivia, might be Peru. But the women thought that was a really awesome hat. Well, the women started wearing it. So it is now part of the culture to wear this hat. The men don't wear it. And I, I just think it's neat. When you look at yeah, the area, cool. all of these women, once they hit a certain age, they can wear this hat. And they're all, I mean, it just looks cool. I'm sorry, but it looks cool. It way better looking than if my dumb butt were to put that hat on. <laughs> you know, they rock it. And I'm a hat guy. I'm always yeah, wearing a hat. Yeah. yeah. I, hat, I just Adam's think hat guy. I, I think it's cool because it, it was uh, basically an import that they adopted for themselves. And then they started making the hats and they're like, this is our style. I think it's cool. Um, now, I'm going to finish my part up here with some of the artifacts that have been found in and around Lake Titicaca. And this, again, comes from the Smithsonian. Uh, it says scientists have dredged Lake Titicaca and found a bunch of artifacts from Tiwanaku civilization. So the Tiwanaku artifacts, including gold medallions and stone carvings, were found in the waters around the lake's island of the sun. So religious iconography and the location of the object suggest that pilgrimages played an important role in the development of this early empire, a practice that would later be adopted by the Inca civilization. It says, quote, the Island of the Sun is an island which has a history going back to 2700 B.C., says Charles Stanish, an archaeologist at the University of South Florida, one of the authors of a new study on this. says it became a very important pilgrimage destination in the Tiwanaku State by around 650 A.D. So Christophe uh, Delaray of the Center uh, for Marine Archaeology at Oxford University first detected underwater archaeological deposits more than a decade ago while diving in the lake. He and his colleagues returned to Koa Reef, an underwater area near the Island of the Sun. The dive team discovered semi-precious carvings like a lapis lazuli puma and a turquoise pendant, as well as valuable thorny oyster shells transported from the warm waters of Ecuador at least 1,250 miles away. So many artifacts also had religious iconography, such as gold medallions depicting a deity with rays exuding from the face and a ceramic incense burner shaped like a smoking jaguar. So the divers also discovered a number of animal bones, the remains of water birds like cormorants and teals, as well as frogs, fish, and llamas. Adam, you you know what I cannot stand is is this time of year when everybody is so busy. Mm -hmm. Got Brooks playing football. I got Piper playing fall softball. You know we are running all the time, and dinner basically consists of sometimes a sandwich or a bowl of cereal. But that's why HelloFresh is so incredible. Right. I mean, it. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to go to the store and plan it. We just get to cook something that's going to be really good and way better than a, just a sandwich. And if you don't know, Hello Fresh. With Hello Fresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes 
delivered right to your door. You don't have to go to the store. You don't have to make a list and and buy ingredients that you don't need or you only need one one teaspoon and you got to buy a bag of it, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And you you wind up, wait, you don't have to worry about all that with HelloFresh. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Like I said, the fall is busy, but it's also a really great time to kick into some fall fresh meals. HelloFresh handles all the meal planning and all the shopping and delivers everything you need to cook up a tasty meal right at home. And when it comes to options, you can't even... Can't even fathom all the options that HelloFresh has. That's why HelloFresh's menu includes 40 recipes and over 100 add-on items to choose from every week. So a busy fall schedule doesn't always uh, have to mean that you don't have time to cook great food. And with HelloFresh, you don't have to spend all evening in the kitchen to whip up a wholesome meal. That's right. And we actually got a box... Uh, a couple days ago so we've had a few meals this week and we just ate one before i came up here and it, it was like a pork chop that had a ginger glaze on it Ooh, and that sounds good rice and broccoli and we try to make sure we do a hello fresh on recording days so that i can eat before coming up here because they're so fast they, mm-hmm. they're literally done like we had this thing done in 20 minutes longest thing was the rice and it goes quick too you know i mean <laughs> right I, but michael loves them we haven't found a meal that he doesn't eat from hello fresh and he's kind of a picky eater he loves helping us cook the meals it, i mean you can't beat it and when you get hello fresh you know you're getting top-notch produce since it travels from the farm to your door in less than seven days and hello fresh has more than just dinners You can also stock your fridge with easy breakfast, quick lunches, and fresh snacks. Just shop HelloFresh Market and add any of these tasty, time-saving solutions to your weekly box. And that's a big deal for breakfast in the morning with kids going to school. A lot of times you're like, I don't have time to to do anything for breakfast. Here's, you know, some pre-made muffins from the store. Well, you don't have to do that with HelloFresh. You can get a quick, easy breakfast to send them off to school. So if you're interested, and you want to get on the HelloFresh train like Matt and our families do, then all you've got to do is go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 graveyard and use the code 50 graveyard. That's five zero G R A V E Y A R D for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. Yeah. I know you may be holding off because you think, Oh, it's just too expensive. Have you been to the grocery store lately? No joke. This is a great time to give HelloFresh a try. All you got to do, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 graveyard. Use our promo code 50 graveyard 50 G-R-A-V-E-Y-A-R-D, and you'll get 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. Later analysis of the llama bones by Delaray and colleagues found that most of them were unfused, revealing at least one infant and three juvenile individuals. The team also found gold ear tassels and other decorative regalia likely attached to the llamas before they were sacrificed. So this Lake Titicaca was an important pilgrimage site for the religious beliefs of these people and they would make sacrifices in the lake near the island of the sun Mm -hmm. you know it's believed that they would take boats out there make the sacrifices sacrifice the llama other sacrifices to their gods in this lake so that just shows how important lake titicaca is and was to the people that live around it. Yeah, exactly. It is it is critical to the culture of these people. Um, and we've already talked about how unique it is, um, how big it is, and, and the elevation. It's such a, a unique place. We don't see anything else like this anywhere else in the world. So 
these people were drawn to it. And of course, they're going to have stories and legend associated with this magical lake that they settled around. And the most common legend revolves around the origin of the lake itself. Uh, it says Lake Titicaca was a fertile valley where happy men lived in this paradise that was protected by the Apus or the mountain gods. Mm -hmm. Now, to enjoy this paradise, men had to live by only one rule. They could not climb to the top of the mountain where the sacred fire burned. That was it. You know, you can do whatever else you want. The one rule is. You cannot climb to the top of the mountain where the sacred fire is. I like that because I wouldn't do it anyway. That's right. I'm, no. like, I'm not going up there. No. You, I got to climb this mountain. Are you joking? Yeah, that ain't okay. But in the land, there was also a devil. And he couldn't bear to see so much happiness. So he incited the men to do what they had been forbidden. And that was to climb to the top of the mountain. And the Apus, the mountain gods, saw this, saw the men climbing the slope, and they were so angry that they released the cougars, which devoured the entire population, except mm. for one couple. Now, faced with this slaughter, Inti, the sun god, wept for 40 days and 40 nights thus creating Lake Titicaca. Everything was flooded, and as a result of this, the cougars were turned to stone. And, and as Adam has said, you know, inside the lake, they have found many artifacts. And it's, it's interesting, too, because the lake is actually smaller than it was 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So... It, it's it's less of well this was right on the shore well no the when they were here the lake was another ten kilometers that way yeah right you know right. so they were coming out here you know mm -hmm. and this stuff you know wound up out here in the water or it was covered by a flood and again the resemblance to the biblical flood you know that's not purely coincidental. I mean, there, there are a lot of religious stories based around um, a large, uh, devastating flood that wiped out the population with the exception of one family, one couple, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Lake Titicaca is famous in the mystical communities for being uh, the center of, of powerful, energetic um, emanations is the word I'm looking for. There are controversial reports by some authors about underground tunnels in the islands. Now, remember, a lot of these islands that are out there in the lake are man-made. So we know those don't have any tunnels. Right. Um, but these other ones that are present, it has been speculated that there are tunnels underneath that could have potentially been in, been inhabited at one point that maybe they were above the the water level at some time. Yeah. We we don't really know. There's a there's debate there. Um but according to another myth that was recorded by Juan de Betanzos, uh, this this myth uh is about Viracocha. And Viracocha was the supreme Incan god. Now, Viracocha, as the legend says, emerged from the waters of Lake Titicaca. Viracocha was also described as, quote, a man of medium height, white, bearded, dressed in a white robe, with a bow attached to his waist, and carrying a staff and a book in his hands. Very, very descriptive there. Yeah. Who's that sound like? Sounds like Moses with a bow and arrow. Mm-hmm. But once again, we see the similarities with the Islamic, Jewish, Christian uh, stories. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of similarities. Why? I mean, th these, are, these are groups that we've believed forever 
that they did not interact. Right. I mean, they were they were on opposite sides of the planet. Mm-hmm. You know, how would their their religious myths be intermingled like this? I'm wondering that a lot of times when you see stuff, you're like, wait a minute, that sounds like this. That mm-hmm. sounds like the Christian flood myth and Noah, or this sounds like, you know, the Christian uh, um, Adam and Eve story. Mm-hmm. And it's all of these different civilizations and cultures have such similar creation myths or mm-hmm. flood myths or whatever. There's got to be something to that. Either they were able to communicate when we didn't think they were, or this crap actually happened the way they say it happened. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Because not everybody, it, it's my, my same theory with mass hallucination. You can't get multiple people standing in the same area to mass hallucinate the same thing mm-hmm. in their heads. So how can you get disparate cultures to create the same? And people say, well, you know, the human brain, it they all work the same. You've met some people, right? Not <laughs> There's some people that got some wacky ideas. They ain't going to think like I think, you know? So there's got to be something going on here that either they communicated worldwide, mm-hmm. that there was some worldwide communication network to pass this myth along and put their own spin on it or it really happened and they're all putting their own little spin on something that really happened yep yep that's exactly what that's exactly what i was thinking i mean you said it verbatim almost so as we're saying uh viracoca uh according to incan mythology um was born out of lake titicaca um he was responsible for creating the sun the moon, people, and the cosmos. Now, in the, I got to, I got to do it now. The Colossusaya Temple at Tiwanaku, which is carved atop a monolith known as, as Adam said, the Gate of the Sun, uh, is a deity holding a lightning bolt and snuff. And I'm, I think a snuff is uh, like what you would put out a, 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 like a ceremonial fire with. It's not that stuff you put in your between your lip and gum. Not yet. I think. Okay. I think that would come much later. They had snooze back in the day. That's right. Cans of snooze. Yeah, no spit. You know. (laughs) Many speculate that this is a representation of Viracocha because the figure is depicted wearing a sun crown. However, it's also possible that this figure represents a deity that the Aymara referred to as Tanupa who, like Viracocha, is associated with legends of creation and destruction. I mean, you know, you're you're not really a god until you've destroyed something. Mm -hmm. You know, you can make everything you want until you've decided that, oh, that's no good. Wipe it out and start over. Yeah, you're not you're not really a god, right? Right. I mean, that's how all the stories go. Yeah, (laughs) you got to get angry at the idiot mortals and then destroy something. Yeah, yeah. But. Knowing what we know about the the gateway of the sun, um, and and when you look at pictures of it, you'll see that figure at the top. This is what they're talking about. This is what mm-hmm. they think could that could be Viracocha or right. whatever the sun deity was to the Tiwanaku, because right. we know right. they were there before the Incas. So it would be really difficult for the Incas to influence. The the Tiwanaku, it it would you would think it would be reversed, but again, right. this happened a long time ago, so we don't really know. Um, if if maybe there was some, you know, so a time where they were both together, and and I mean, who knows? We've talked we talked about how the Incas operated, so there's always that chance. Now, Aymara legends put Tiwanaku at the center of the universe. Okay probably because of the importance of its geographical location, which we discussed earlier. The Tiwanaku were highly aware of their natural surroundings and would use them and their understanding of astronomy 
as reference points in their architectural plans. Okay, where have we seen this before? All the other ancient sites. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, we've we've seen it at the pyramids. We've seen it at Stonehenge. You know, we're seeing it here. Okay, um, the most significant landmarks in Tiwanaku are the mountains and Lake Titicaca. Although the shores of Lake Titicaca are now located 20 kilometers west of Tiwanaku. Like I said, the lake has decreased in size due to drought. But it used to be bigger and it was closer to the Tiwanaku site uh, than it is now. But in ancient times, it likely extended all the way up. Now, the spiritual importance and location of the lake uh, contributed to the religious significance of Tiwanaku. If Lake Titicaca was this mystical lake 2,000 years ago, then the building of the temples and the, and the monoliths and everything in that location had to be significant. There had mm-hmm. to be a religious significance there because we know how they viewed the lake. So why right. else would you build these structures here on the lake unless this is part of your, your spiritual origin? Now, let's talk about the Tiwanaku story on the birth of humanity. Now, their story on on the beginning of humans is an interesting one. The story says that after Viracocha rose from the waters of Titicaca, he created a team of stone or mud giants and instructed them to build all the megalithic sites and carve statues of their great god, along the path of Viracocha, which is this long extended trail that is lined with these stones and these carvings supposedly representing Viracocha. Um, It began at Tiwanaku. Now, eventually the giants turned against their creator and Viracocha turned them back into stone thus explaining the presence of these large monolithic humanoid statues. Okay. You know, so I'm going to make the giants. The giants are going to do my bidding. The giants get tired of doing it. So I just turn them back into stone and mud Mm -hmm. and whatever, you know, and now they're, now they're just kind of stuck there. Now, some of the, if I could do it, I would too. That's right. (laughs) Again, that's what, that's what, that's what makes you a God, you know, in the, (laughs) it's like, Hey, I, I I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. Yep. <laughs> it don't matter to me because I'll make another one just look just like it. That's Sounds old, like that's my old. mom. <laughs> that's right. Now, Adam mentioned this earlier. Some of the statues are made from andesite that was quarried from Cerro uh, Cerro Capilla. I know I'm saying that wrong. Is it, maybe I can't see. No, it's is Cerro Capilla. That's the only way I can pronounce it. This was across the lake in Peru. Now, remember, I said earlier, it's a big, big lake. Mm-hmm. Huge this enormous. is, you know, 2,000 years ago or more. Think about the, uh, the Great Lakes. Yeah. And trying to cross the Great Lakes if you're here in North America. Yeah. You know, it's, it's huge. Yeah. Even think about an ancient civilization trying to go from one side of Lake Michigan to the other. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so I mean, you know, if if we could find the most narrow point, that's still, you know, a, a an extraordinarily daunting and dangerous task for an ancient civilization, or so we th- believe. So we think. Yeah. yeah. Um. So uh, along this trail, there are these huge monoliths that they call lazy stones, and they still exist, and they mark the route to the Tiwanaku site. And it's theorized that andesite was taken from that particular site because it was thought to possess a certain energy or even a spirit that made it the best material for a statue of a god. Now, if you if you buy into the idea of giants did all this, then giants grabbing up these huge rocks and walking them to the other side of the lake, okay, they might could have done that. But if you take that as a myth, um, it really makes you start to wonder. It makes me wonder, wonder how 
How did they do it? And number two, why? Why not yep. use what they yep. had right there? Unless there was something special about the andesite that was on the other side of the lake. Well, and we see that with several other cultures. We see it with Tiwanaku. We see it with uh, uh, um, Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. We see it with the pyramids. Mm -hmm. These stones that they're using, there has to be something about these stones that they knew or that they thought mm -hmm. during that time because it is a monumental task with uh, technology or not. Whether they had more technology than we assume or not, it's a monumental task. And all of these cultures go and get stone and bring it elsewhere. And we've heard, well, you know, their God told them this is the stone to use. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I gather that, but why? Like you're saying, why this specific stone? And, and that's what we don't have is records of why these stones were chosen. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's funny because, uh, in this documentary, it, they ask some native community members, um, who, who, who built Tiwanaku giants. Mm -hmm. I mean, they also I mean, giants, you know, it's just, it's the legend, you know, that's what they, that's what they grew up hearing. That's what their, their fathers, grandfathers, and, and that's what they were told. And so it's still there. It's still fresh in people's minds that, that this was something that was done by giants. Um, but interesting about these lazy stones, these stones that, that are along this path of Viracocha, native community members will tell stories about seeing these statues walk around at night yeah, and even approach humans to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine one of these big giant statues come walking up to you or waddling up to you? Hey, uh, hey, buddy, you got a light, you know, I, who knows? What, what, do you, what do they need help with? You know, could, could you even say no to them? That would be the problem. <laughs> yeah. If I had a, a big ass stone dude walk up to me and go, hey, give me a hand with it. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> That's please right. Don't tip on me. <laughs> but, whatever you need, brother. Yeah. Whatever you need. But but assuming that these walking stones didn't just get up and walk their butts across the lake some 40 kilometers away from the quarry site, 40 mm -hmm. kilometers they had to drag this stuff. Or not just drag, they couldn't drag it. They had to get through the water. And, and as I said earlier, the, the lake is a thousand feet deep in some areas. Okay. How in the heck could they do that? Well, the... The easy guess is they did it by boat, okay? Yep. Um, and, and the stonework that we were talking about earlier shows how skilled the craftsmen of the Tiwanaku were. So if they can make cuts, if they can join stones together like this, they most likely could build a pretty good boat. Um, so a, a lot of people... Uh, archaeologists, I mean, they believe that this is just a, 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 a wonderful example of human ingenuity uh, that allowed these people to move these stones to their final location. Now, University of Pennsylvania researcher Alexei Vranich led an expedition to prove his theory on how the stones were transported. Now, he theorized that the reed boats were used to get the stones across the lake. So utilizing tools that would have been available at the time, his team set out to construct boats out of Totoro reeds farmed by using a long pole with a blade to reach underwater and cut the reeds about 12 inches from the bottom. Now, this was important because this would allow the reeds to continue to grow and they would be ready for harvesting the next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they actually show a gentleman doing this. Okay. And he's got the, what looks like a long bamboo pole, which is the pole is probably made of reeds. Um, probably. And there's a blade on the end of it. And he is, he is dipping this thing down deep into water that he cannot see the bottom. And he is just, very smoothly sweeping this blade through and then pulling a bundle of these, a big bundle of these reeds that 
probably average anywhere from six to 10 feet long uh, up into the boat. And he's yeah. on this little, like little reed skiff where he's like, it's like a paddle board, you know, he's standing up on it and he's collecting the reeds. This is what they had to do if they were going to, if, if they were going to prove that the Tiwanaku used these reed boats to get these giant stones across the lake, they had to do it just like they would have done it. Sure. And it proved to be an exhausting effort. Just getting the boat to the water was a significant challenge. I mean, yeah. you know, they're trying to roll this, this big reed boat on, on logs and they're, they're making essentially rolling tracks, you know, with, with these big logs to try to get it a hundred yards to the water from where they constructed it. And they've got, I mean, there's probably 200 people helping them. Yeah. Get it yep. there. And, and they, they mess up, <laughs> they knock over this Adobe wall, you know, I mean, it, 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 it was not pretty but they finally got it in the water. But once they got it in the water, their problems didn't end because uh, Lake Titicaca is huge, 5,300 5, square miles. It's more ocean sailing than it is lake sailing. Yeah. And that includes winds of over 40 knots. Like you're out in the open sea. Now, as they were making their initial voyage to the other side of the lake where the quarry was the boat took damage in a storm and it had to be repaired but ultimately the team was successful they got um they they got one of these large like i am 90 ton stone onto the boat and got it to the other side of the lake but it took a lot of people. I mean, I a lot imagine. of people. I mean, it's it, it looks like a looks like a daggum concert. There's so many, you know, it's like are the Backstreet Boys in town? Mm-hmm. You know, there's people everywhere that yeah. are, and they're all doing some aspect of this to try to help these guys succeed. And even though they did accomplish their goal. It was still just one stone. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, it was all of that. It took them months to get one stone from one side of the lake to the other. And truthfully, there is no guarantee that everything they did was exactly how the Tiwanaku would have done it. In fact, I'd say it, they may be 50%. Um, that's just a guess. I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I just can't see how you could reenact um, a process that you may not have enough evidence to reenact. You know, exactly. Right. You're just making right. a lot of assumptions here. Um, That's always been my thing is how you're like they did with the pyramids. Yeah. You're guessing as to how they do it because you're guessing as to what their technology was. You're guessing as to what they were capable of doing. It's all a guess. So yeah. maybe it's right. Right. But it could be completely wrong, too. Just like this complex system of, of ropes and pulleys and logs and people that drug these large stones for the pyramids up these seemingly impossible inclines. Mm-hmm. There's... There's no way that we know that that's right. We've just figured out how to do it with what we know they could do. Yeah, what we think they could do. But it all goes back to the the point that Adam and I make pretty routinely is they must have had some technology that we don't know about. Right. They, I mean, they had to. This, I mean, even even figuring out a way to do these things. Um trying to avoid using our modern technology it's 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 just a guess yeah. we're just superimposing what we believe on what they actually did and we may not be right because right. they they must have had something 
And I'm not saying they had iPhones and they're out there taking pictures. You know, all we're saying is they understood something that we didn't know they understood. They, they understood how to move large stone. They understood how to construct um, uh, buildings and surfaces so that, you know, they, they would withstand harsh weather, you know, that, they, that the rains wouldn't completely destroy them. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, where they got that knowledge, we don't know. And that's debatable, but it, it, it just seems obvious that they knew something that, that today, you know, e even people that researched, we just don't, we aren't hundred percent sure how they did it. Right. Right. Now, um, there, there are a lot of connections with cosmology and Tiwanaku, um, and, and in many Andean cultures, um, you know, the mountains are, are they're sacred objects. You know, the, there, there was something about the mountain, you know, the gods lived on a mountain or, you know, whatever. Now, um, in reality, the site of Tiwanaku is located in the valley between two sacred mountains, Pukura and Chikikawa. Now, at such temples in ancient times, ceremonies were conducted to honor and pay gratitude to gods and spirits, and they were places of worship and rituals that helped unify the Andean people through shared symbols and pilgrimage destinations. And Tiwanaku became the center of this pre-Columbian religious ceremony for both the general public and the elites. So, for example... Human sacrifice was used in several pre-Columbian civilizations to appease a god in exchange for good fortune. Excavations of the Akapana Temple at Tiwanaku revealed that the remains of sacrificial dedications of humans and camelids. Camelids would be like llamas. Yeah. Now, researchers speculate that the Akap Akapana Temple may also have been used as an astronomical observatory it was constructed so that it was aligned with the peak of kim sacha providing a view of the rotation of the milky way from the southern pole other temples like kalasasya uh, try to say that and i'll never say it that way again mm -hmm. um they are positioned to provide views of the sunrise on the equinox the summer solstice, and the winter solstice. Although the symbolic and functional value of these monuments is just speculation, the Tiwanaku were able to study and interpret the positions of the sun, moon, Milky Way, and other celestial bodies well enough to give them a significant role in their architecture. So beyond the idea of, okay, this ancient civilization was able to build this you know, incredible example of stone craftsmanship. They were able to get this, you know, and, uh, and from the other side of an enormous lake that was cold and, and then put it all together. They also understood about celestial bodies and they used that in the construction of the Tiwanaku temples. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, again, how? How did they know? How were they able to do that? You know, how were they able to position, you know, these the, these gates and 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 these temples so that on those specific times of year that it would be aligned just so where you could see the the sunrise at the equinox that you could mm -hmm. track the rotation of the Milky Way. I mean, come on, this is 2000 years ago. Yeah. And yeah, I wanted to throw this, throw this at you because you were talking about, you know, we talked about the blocks and we talked about the joints of the blocks and all this stuff. I'm, I'm going to throw this theory that I read at you and get your thoughts. See if they're the same as what I've got. They say, that the H blocks, especially the ones you were talking about being like the I beams, the I uh -huh. joints. Right. There's a bunch of those H blocks there. The H blocks show it and the fact that the joints are so tight 
that this shows, this is proof or, quote, scientific evidence that these blocks are artificial geopolymer rock or that they were able to melt the rock to form these joints. So what they're saying is that they were heated, mm-hmm. superheated to a point where they lavaed, and then they were flattened together so that the joints, you know, are are so tight you can't put a razor blade through them. I see how that would work. Like I, I get the theory behind that, and that the H blocks they're so squared off, and the the seams are so perfect on there that. That could be what they're saying, artificial geopolymer rock, so molded mm-hmm. rock. But I, my, my thought is, yes, I, I do believe there was technology then using technology loosely. Not, I'm not talking about like handheld computers or like you said, iPhones or Samsungs or anything back then. But. Yes, they had this technology that we don't understand or know they had, but I don't personally think they had a way of melting the andesite (laughs) rock and and shaping it into form. Yeah, I mean, you know, even with fire, they would still they would still have to find a way to generate more heat to melt Mm. stone. I mean, you know, I, I go out here with a cigarette lighter right now and put put it to a rock, and it ain't. It's not going to do anything. No, you, know, you need many thousands of degrees to melt a stone. Exactly, and and it just it that that seems way beyond what anybody would expect if they if they were able to generate that much heat to do that. I mean, we don't even do that now, right? <laughs> and we can melt rock. You know, yeah. we've got <laughs> furnaces that can get that high. But we don't even, <laughs> yeah, we don't do it. And, and even, e- even if they had forging abilities to forge weapons out of steel, you still couldn't get it hot enough to melt stone into lava yeah. where you could then mold it into these H blocks or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, when you talk about Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, Stuff like that always comes up. And then they say, well, it was cut by lasers. And that's why it's so smooth. Yeah. And lasers. Lasers. <laughs> sharks Sharks with freaking lasers on their head. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, uh, I, I promised you guys I'd get to this. Uh, who might have had lasers? Aliens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And that's kind of why I threw that yeah, in. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> We can't. You can't talk about. It. Somebody is going to come up with the, the idea that aliens helped because it's been it's been pitched out there about the pyramids forever. Um, you know, Stonehenge too. So why not Tiwanaku? You know, the aliens come down. They were like, "Hey guys, look at this. You know, see, you know, play with this toy. You know, what you look what you cut the rock with this thing. Oh, yeah. great. You know, this is how you make these joints so it won't fall over." You know, this, this is how you can do this. I, I don't know. I don't know that it seems, that seems even less plausible than the giants, to be honest with you. Uh, for me, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, but there is something interesting about it. And it was the discovery of elongated skulls. Right. Yeah. And they predate the milestones that were already established for the Tiwanaku civilization. Right. So it, it would indicate ancient, that ancient yeah, civilization, that there was a civilization there before Tiwanaku. Yeah. And for whatever reason, they may have had elongated skulls, which would make you wonder. Okay. Some people say it's an alien skull. Ah, but could it be, a different race, an advanced yep. race that was there, that had been there for millions of years, maybe. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, they were like, it's, it's time for us to go. And they left with, you know, virtually n- no evidence other than maybe these skulls and, and so, but what if they lingered around and they were there to show the Tiwanaku this is how you do these things. 
Right. You know, this is right. this is how this works. This is how the earth works. Why would they know? Because they've been here for millions of years. And and it's possible that the Tiwanaku didn't completely build Pumapunku and the Tiwanaku area. It was already partially built or completely built by that predated civilization. Right. You know, we, I mean, it, this gets into the woo-woo train, but it's like the um, Atlantis myth mm-hmm. where they were supposed to be technologically advanced. So if the, if it was the same race of people from before uh, the, the quote, modern Tiwanaku or whatever, what if, you know, maybe they moved? Yeah. Maybe they up and moved to another part. And then that civilization stayed around, and it's what the Greeks knew as the people that lived on Atlantis, the the modern, you know, advanced civilization that had all this stuff. Maybe it was a traveling band of highly advanced peoples. Yeah, and and that is a theory that I can get behind. Same, you know that. You know, if you if you develop technology, you know, that was more advanced than what a civilization 2000 years in the future was going to realize you had, where did you get it? You know, did you did you learn it? If you learned it, where did you learn it from? Yeah. You know, I mean, there had to have been some indicator that they didn't just figure it out. You know, they didn't just go, I mean, because you think about it. it, If you've got a group of people, it doesn't matter, you know, what 2000 years ago, yesterday, you know, if, if they're going to go to a site and they're going to go, this is where we're going to construct whatever. We're going to use the materials that are the most readily available to us. Why would Mm -hmm. they have even known that the andite on the other side of the lake was what they should have been using? Unless something mm-hmm. or someone told them this rock There's over here lot. is better. You know, this There's is what you need to use. Ancient cultures that speak of their ancestors that taught them how to do stuff. Right. And, you know, some say it was gods. So, but like the uh, Veracoca, he didn't look like the Tiwanaku people. Right. He was white. Right. White skinned. Had you know a book and and staff and all this. So, what if because that matches a lot of that description matches what a lot of cultures from the Americas say about ancient peoples? So, what if there was a band of these ancient super smart people that went through and they'd live in an area for a little while? When more people started kind of moving there, they'd teach them stuff and move on. Mm-hmm. And then that perpetuated the myth of these gods or these ancient peoples where their civilization started from. And I'm a firm believer that humanity has risen and fallen multiple times within the Earth's history. Completely, you know, get to a, a point of high technology for the time and then get wiped out. What if? One of those cycles, not everybody was wiped out. And it was this band that moved throughout the Americas, maybe throughout Asia and Africa and stuff, and was showing things to the next generation of humans that were coming along because most everybody got knocked back to the Stone Age because of this event Mm -hmm. that happened on earth, but they hung on to their knowledge and their abilities and they taught it to these people. Yeah. Viracocha being a good example. I think, I think, I think everybody has an idea that the Americas were populated with these native American tribes and that was it. You know, whether we're talking about, um, you know, all the way from, you know, in Canada, down through what is now the United States, you know, across Latin America into South America, you know, they, they were, they were all along there, but there's, 
a really good chance that they weren't it. Mm-hmm. And there's also a really good chance that they weren't first. Right, right. So, you know, take take that for what you will. It it just when you when you begin to look at the world with that kind of open view, I mean, it just it, it blows your way. And Adam and I could sit here and discuss this for another two hours. Um, we're not going to do that, <laughs> but we're going to ask not you tonight, guys. I guess. What do you think? You know, what do you think? Did did the 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 Tiwanaku, did they have some help? Did did somebody was somebody already there that showed them how to do this stuff? That that taught them what what stones to use? Um or did they know? Where did they come from? Did they migrate up the mountain and decide to settle at Lake Titicaca or were they already there? You know, did, were was this just where they were from? Were they from a higher elevation? Um, mm-hmm. Lots of questions. Let us know what you think. And the best place to do that is in our Facebook group. Just go on Facebook and search Graveyard. Uh, you'll find us there. Um, the Graveyard is absolutely teeming with activity every day. You know, it's one of the coolest groups of people. Um you know, oh, we, yeah. we don't have any trouble. It's, it, you know, we just want to hear great stories. So if, if you've got that, some good experience to share. One guy named Carl. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about guy. Carl. Oh, but, man. You know. He's harmless. Sorry. If your name is Carl, I'm just making a joke. <laughs> just, uh, but when you're done there, you can go check out our website, which is graveyardpodcast.com. And there you can find links to purchase Graveyard Tales merchandise. You can listen to the show and you can become a patron. And we, we we mentioned this at the top of the show. Um, we, we couldn't keep doing this without the support of our patrons. So thank you very much. Um, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes. It brings us up the charts and it makes it easier for people to find the show. Whew, this was a good one, man. Mm-hmm. I, I love topics like this. You know, one of my passions besides cryptozoology is ancient civilization. That's right. So this is right up my alley. That's right. I love it. Until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon.